if I'm talking about how, and this is, by the way, all myths of the golden age are pretty much structurally the same. Interestingly, it always turns out that we were the good guys, right? Like try to think of a myth of a golden age where the other guys were the good guys. Uh, it, if it's funnily, it all kind of comes down to the same thing. It's always, we were the good guys, we were innocent, and then the bad people came and they like polluted us or you know, they did something very bad. It's structurally always the same. And it doesn't even matter whether you're an empire or not. You can, you can be the most powerful empire in the world, the most powerful empire, in the in, in, most powerful country in the world, um, hint USA. And you can still come up with a story of how you were the victim and the other people came and they polluted you. But like all, the, the structure is always the same. And so when you, have a, when you have a story of which Putin's version of the baptism in Kiev is one example, you have a story about how everything was always static. Everything was pure, right? That's why the baptism, by the way, is so attractive. Like, it's not that Putin actually goes to church or like that the Russian church you know, really exists as such, but, it's the, the, but, the, but baptism is a notion of, it's a, it's a cleansing, right? It's a purifying, it's a starting again. And that's why, that's why it's such an attractive image in this story. The baptism allows us to forget all the things that happened before and, and present history or the past as this kind of clean unity where anything which was polluting came from the outside, right? And that is a way of getting rid of diversity or getting rid of the things which might, um, as historians or as students of history, we might actually find to be interesting. Um, where, you know, the, the, it gets rid of things coming from other places. It gets, rid of, it gets rid of origins. It gets rid of innovation. It gets rid of all of the interesting stuff. Like, for example, the alphabet, right? The alphabet might seem like something which is eternal. I mean, <clears throat> when was the last time you guys thought about the alphabet? All right, that's not the question that you were dreaming your professor was going to ask you the first week of Yale. He's asking me about the alphabet, Mom. I can't believe it. I studied so hard. Um, so the, the alphabet is a really interesting creation. It was actually only invented once, like a lot of things that we take for granted and then copied a bunch of times. The specific Cyrillic alphabet, which, um, which, which came to Kiev after the baptism, was invented by a couple of, we'll talk about this, a couple of Byzantine priests who were trying to convert not Kiev, but Moravia, not then, but a couple centuries before. And they had an interesting um, career and it wandered and ended up in Kiev. And then suddenly you have this alphabet. And then that Cyrillic alphabet can seem like a kind of eternal marker of like East and West or whatever, once it's established, but it's actually an innovation which came from the outside, right? Like for that matter, Christianity itself. So when you, when you focus on how things, or if you pretend that things are static, what you're doing is you're excluding all the diversity, all of the innovation, and all the things which came from the outside. Um, what we're gonna be trying to do in this class is make the opposite point. That what's interesting about Ukraine is that rather than being part of some, somebody else's myth of purity, right, um, is that Ukraine actually embodies in a very intense form most of the major themes of European history and some of the major themes of European history, of, of, of world history. Um, that what we're, what we're gonna try to be arguing is that as a result of Ukraine's geography, um, as a result of this north-south axis at the beginning and an east-west axis later on, all of the themes of, U of European history appear in Ukrainian history just in a slightly more interesting form, right? So the Vikings, for example. If you're interested in European history, you may be interested in the Vikings. The Vikings, let's face it, they're interesting, okay? So you have this mainstream of European development where the Franks start a state and the Vikings react to the Franks and they start raiding the Franks and they invent, they invent these boats and they, they, they travel all over the world. Very cool. But maybe the single most lasting trace of the Viking Age is Kiev. Right? The Vikings founded states, they knocked over states, they founded states all over the place. Normandy, for example. Normandy, as you might remember, invades England and establishes England in the form that we know it today. Vikings matter a lot. Um, but, you know, Norwegian democracy, it all has to do with the Vikings. But Kiev may be the single most interesting legacy of the Viking Age, maybe the most durable legacy of the Viking Age. When you look, when you look at pictures of wartime Kiev now, which 
you know, where San Sofia is still standing, thankfully, like that's a legacy of Viking civilization. That's a legacy of, of Vikings converting to, um, <clears throat> to, to Christianity. If you think about the history of the, the Reformation, right? Oh, the Reforma we all know the Reformation is a big theme of European history. Suddenly there are Protestants as well as Catholics and maybe there's a hundred years war and a third of the population of Germany is going to get wiped out and the printing press comes along and suddenly there can be disputations which seem to lead to a lot of violence. Um, this whole thing about the internet causing trouble so far is like nothing compared to the printing press. Like we may, we may get there, but like the printing press came along and that was, that was a mess. But in, in Ukraine you have the Reformation, but it's not Catholics and Protestants, it's the Orthodox and the Greek Catholics and the, Catholic, and the Catholics and the Protestants and all kinds of Protestants. And you have a religious war in 1648, which is also a proto-national war and an anti-colonial war and something which is extremely interesting. So basically everything that happens in European history happens in Ukrainian history just slightly more intensely and sometimes slightly earlier. And indeed one of the themes or one of the things that I hope you'll notice as we go along is that George Orwell said this, that the hardest thing to notice is what's right in front of your nose, right? Just, I don't know, if this is your first week at Yale, like maybe like 50 years from now when you're an alum, you'd be like, my professor told me the hardest thing to notice is what's right in front of your nose. If you take that away, I'll also be happy. Um, but but, it, but it's, it's true, right? The, the things which are most intensely obvious are very often the things that are hardest to take on. And history, in a way, is actually like, oh, America's an empire? I mean, his, history is a way of picking up on the obvious because it gives it to you from a whole bunch of different angles at the same time and then maybe the obvious will eventually come 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 through right um so um so 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 the point is that ukraine is at the absolute center of a lot of things which we regard as central i mean i've given you the viking age and the reformation which may seem a little exotic it's absolutely at the center of the first world war it's absolutely at the center of the second world war it's absolutely at the center of stalinist terror it's absolutely at the center of the holocaust it's absolutely at the center of the collapse of the soviet union um, it's at the center of major historical developments not just ancient and medieval but also very contemporary but the fact that it's precisely the fact that it's at the center of the development makes it hard to see and hard to notice. It's sometimes hard to direct your gaze at the thing which is most important. Sometimes because where things are most important is also where things are darkest, right? And very, and very often Ukraine is going to be a kind, um, a kind of heart of darkness. Who wrote Heart of Darkness, by the way? Where is he from? I'll give you one more try. You're guessing though, right? Yeah. So you're not wrong that he was from Poland, but it's a very interesting trajectory. Okay, so Heart of Darkness is a famous, famous book about the race for Africa. It's a remarkable novel. Conrad's a remarkable writer. Conrad is a Pole. How does he know about colonialism? Because he's from Ukraine, right? Um, there's a recent Polish history book about Ukraine, which is called Poland's Heart of Darkness, which of course the Poles really didn't in general like to hear, um, but it's a very valid point. In the, during the Renaissance period, as we'll see, Polish colonialism in Ukraine was incredibly intense. And that gives Conrad the background to understand the European race for Africa. And in turn, Hannah Arendt's Origins of Totalitarianism is basically one long riff on Joseph Conrad's novel, Heart of Darkness, right? So, and so it's not surprising that, that Origins, that, um, that, that, that Arendt actually understands that Ukraine is important, just kind of closing, closing the loop here. But a heart of darkness is something which is hard to see, and, and, but that doesn't mean it's unimportant, right? That doesn't, so the thing, things get wiped out of the history that are precisely the things that, that, we, have, that we have to see.